But first, Sub-Saharan Africa is the only region where violent extremism is getting markedly worse. Global deaths from terrorist attacks have fallen by a third since 2015. But in 2021, almost half of the global loss of life to violent extremism was in Sub-Saharan Africa, with Somalia, Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali the most affected. Recruitment is also on the rise. An investigation from the UN's International Development Agency says that those signing up are doing so because of economic factors rather than religious ones. And it's also raised concerns that military anti-terror campaigns can sometimes make the problems more profound. For a closer look at their findings, I'm joined now by Ahim Steiner from the UNDP. Ahim, thanks very much for making the time to speak to us. So first of all, is there anything unique about Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa that's led to it becoming an increasingly important staging site for extremist activity? Well, I think in principle, one has to begin by answering no, because we have seen these phenomena also occur in other parts of the world. What I think in part is happening, however, is that in uh, a number of African nations, um, the weakness of the state, the corrosion of that social contract between people and, and their governments have created a kind of space and the vacuum into which violent extremist groups can easily enter and uh, essentially uh, put down their roots. And that is what we have seen, particularly in the Sahel region and even beyond that in recent years. Now, the report departs from some uh, perhaps widely accepted assumptions about what can cause radicalism. Um, and the insight that you have comes from uh, interviews that you've done with thousands of combatants or former combatants. Now, what have you learned about the reality of what is driving um, Sub-Saharan Africans to join extremist groups and also to, to leave them? Well, in 2017, we published um, a major report that for the first time actually went and uh, interviewed either combatants, former combatants, people in jail to better understand what motivated them, what drove them into the hands of these violent extremist groups. And we have now tripled the sample and in 2022, uh, 2021, interviewed over 2,100 people in eight countries, because I think much of what we are increasingly finding is that the narrative that people are being pulled, for example, by religious extremism into these groups is actually less valid than the push factors, which are the search for jobs. 25% of people who ended up in these violent extremist groups said it is the ability to earn an income, a livelihood. If you add up uh, those who said that economic desperation was pushing them out of their communities, you add another 40%. So a very significant part of the capacity to recruit derives from economic uh, desperation on the one hand, and in many of these countries, essentially the absence of a developmental state, the basic services of education, health not being available. And then many also commented that these groups then sometimes provide alternative security, alternative justice, which in the absence of a nation state and the government being present, become the kind of factors that lead communities to fall uh, in with these groups. But many who also have left them recognize that very often they have been false promises. Now, another point that you have raised within the report um, is the effect of military crackdowns, how they can sometimes inflame tensions. Um, funnily enough, we actually tackled this very question yesterday on Eye on Africa. We were talking about some of the concerns seen in, in Eastern DR Congo and the, the, the military response there. Um, but particularly, you know, considering uh, volatile regions like Eastern DR Congo, what is the alternative when you're faced with persistent armed violent extremism? Well, let me be very frank. There is certainly no silver bullet, nothing that can you know, just turn the whole situation around. But what we have seen is that the securitized approach where military police forces uh, essentially confront these phenomena of violent extremism have largely failed. And therefore, we need to go back to the fundamental drivers of this. And much of what UNDP, much of what we as the UN today try to do in the Sahel region, for instance, is to tackle issues of um, poverty. And very basically speaking, for a fraction of the cost, we can help communities to reestablish viable local economies. You know, just building a market hall, having a police station, having the courts function again, a school, a health center. These are the kinds of services that, you know, people are looking for, for their children, for their families, to be able to make a living. 
that is at a fraction of the cost ultimately the better way of dealing with this and unfortunately what you also alluded to is whenever you put military and security apparatus into such conflicts inevitably there are you know also human rights violations and 50 percent almost 50 percent of those we interviewed actually cited these trigger events and human rights violations being the most prominent ones as events that drove them also to join these movements you know when the military invades a village when your father gets arrested or maybe your sister is raped um, or your brother or sister are killed. Those are traumatic events that very often have also been an explanation that we have found of why people join these violent extremist groups in the first place. So it becomes a vicious circle. And the way out of that, that is the core message of our work, is we must go back to the fundamentals of development and address the root causes that are pushing people into the hands of these violent extremist groups. Thank you very much, Akeem Steiner there from the UNDP.